because um, he's going to give the next talk. Uh, so Ken Algapi um, is a molecular neuropathologist. He is currently the chief of the laboratory of pathology at the NCI Center for Cancer Research. Uh, Dr. Algapi earned his MD from the University of California, San Francisco, and then he did his residency and fellowship in anatomic pathology and neuropathology there as well. He was appointed to the faculty at UCSF and was there for some years and then was recruited on to MD Anderson Cancer Center, where he ultimately was chair of the Department of Pathology. Uh, he then moved to uh, Toronto and was at Toronto General Hospital and Research Institute uh, and had an, a, a clinical appointment at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center. Uh, and then he was attracted to move to NCI. Um, he is uh, doing a, a considerable amount of work for uh, as a central uh, a referral laboratory uh, with uh, methylation array classifiers, as well as other kinds of molecular biology of, of cancer in general and pediatric cancer and pediatric neuroanthology in particular. Uh, so I'm going to turn things over to, to Ken, and I'm going to have to log off because I have a conflict uh, here at the local institution, but, but I'll be back later. Thank Ken? you. I'll, I'll take over. Thank you. Thanks so much, Doug, for the kind introduction. Um, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to share um, what we've been doing on methylation profiling of uh, CNS tumors. Uh, I wonder, can you, can you see my slide? Yes, uh, see it clearly, yeah, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit about our experience using methylation profiling um, as an adjunct to diagnosis and classification of central nervous system tumors, making the overall point that it's an extremely useful adjunct when placed in the context of the entire case. It doesn't replace what we have, it adds to what we have and adds new value uh, to that to improve accuracy and precision of brain tumor diagnostics. So let's see, if I can, there we go, no disclosures. Okay, so classification, I think, as we know it, began um, about 100 years ago with actually a neurosurgeon, Harvey Cushing, um, working with a neuropathologist, um, also uh, had an initial classification of neuropathial tumors. And some of these entities are, main, are maintained to this day, medulloblastoma, glioblastoma, ependymoma, oligodendroglioma, et cetera. So this has been tried and true to uh, look at the tissue uh, histologically and to uh, diagnose it based on its appearance um, on, under the microscope. And that's really the, the, the process that's been going on um, over the, the, the 20th century, which was using the microscope as the mainstay of diagnosis of CNS tumors. And although we get, we get reasonably far that way, the problem is that for difficult cases, and I would say it's magnified for pediatric um, uh, CNS tumors because of their heterogeneity and their rarity, that it can be on certain cases subjective. There can be ambiguous cases that are difficult to classify based on how they look. And that ends up being that sometimes we're not able to give a definitive diagnosis. So we give what we call a descriptive diagnosis, high grade glioma or embryonal tumor or, or, or what have you. And you can imagine in that situation, and here's a paper from um, about 20 years ago, basically looking at histopathology-based diagnostics. Uh, and in this, in this paper, and there's many of these kinds of papers looking at 500 cases that were reviewed, that were received on the out, from the out, outside institutions to MD Anderson Cancer Center. Um, you can see that a good proportion, 40% of these cases were deemed discrepant between the outside institution and the and the, uh, the and MD Anderson. Now, who, who knows who's correct? I'm not saying that one's correct and the other's not. It's more that there are discrepancies when one uses histopathology as the sole uh, means of, of, of diagnosis. So it's good, it's not perfect, and there's room for improvement. The, um, the WHO classification, which, as you know, has, has just come out in the 2021 version, um, it, I think, as was mentioned, it increases the number of distinct entities, number one. But also the other advance is that many of the entities in the past were defined by how they looked in the microscope. That's still included. But now you can see, and this is just a snapshot of some of the um, many entities in the WHO, you can see just by their names that they involve a molecular signature or a molecular profile or a mutation 
as an as part of the definition of that entity. So medulloblastomas are broken up uh, into, into subgroups based on uh, the activation of certain pathways and mutations. Um, other embryonal tumors, you can see here just scanning down, uh, are defined by the presence of a molecular alteration such that the molecular alteration is required for that diagnosis. So no molecular alteration, no, no definitive diagnosis. So diffuse astrocytoma, MIB or MIB-L1 altered, requires the establishment of alteration in, in this gene to make that a definitive diagnosis. So that uh, in concept will reduce subjectivity and increase accuracy and precision. That said, um, we do as pathologists hold to the tried and true method of an integrated diagnosis. There's no one kind of modality that can be used in isolation. We need all the information we can get and we'd like it to all fit together into a, a, a pattern that gives us an integrated diagnosis. And that includes the H&E, that includes the radiologic imaging, uh, molecular testing if available, the clinical history of the patient, um, age of the patient, um, location of the tumor and clinical history, as well as some, some special stains that, that may, may, or may, not be, may or may not be relevant. And so all these fit together. And here's just an example of ETMR, embryonal tumor with multilayered rosettes, histology showing a typical pattern, immunostochemistry of a particular stain, LIN, LIN 28, imaging is consistent, um, the clinical uh, information is consistent, it occurs in a child, and then uh, uh, the use of things like next generation sequencing or FISH to find the, the C19MC amplifications present in some of these tumors, they all fit together for an integrated diagnosis, such that no one of these uh, modalities by itself can give us the diagnosis. We need it all to fit together. And so, as I mentioned, uh, there is a lot of heterogeneity in these brain tumors, and there's case-to-case -case variation on the importance of some of these modalities. In some tumor types, the H&E uh, the &E is nearly diagnostic without, without any issues. Um, there's other cases where the H&E the &E is just the beginning. There's really not very specific for a specific diagnosis. It may be that the molecular is, is critical. So there's case-to-case -case variation on how these data are, are, are integrated. So, you know, some, as you know, some tumor types have characteristic features. Medulloblastoma is required to be in, in the posterior fossa, as you know, typically in children and young adults. Other tumor types are, have highly characteristic histopathology, for example, subependymoma. Other types have a wide range of histopathology, but are unified by a, a single test or, or, or just a small number of tests. For example, uh, ATRT showing loss of, of INI1. Uh, in the real world, we find that many cases don't fit perfectly together into a recognized entity. Sometimes it, it doesn't all fit in, into something that we can be confident of. For example, the case may lack characteristic histopathology, or perhaps it has histopathology that's suggestive of a particular tumor type, but it's an unusual clinical setting. Maybe the patient age is, is not typical or the location, et cetera. And so this, when, when things don't fit, as I mentioned, then that's where it leads to inter-observer variation and diagnoses that are what we call descriptive. They're not specific for a single entity, um, but they're more general. And so the, what we're talking about today then in, 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 this, in, in this talk is how methylation profiling can add to that, not to replace all the, these data sources that are critical, but how it can supplement things when we can't get to a definitive diagnosis by conventional means. So the methylation pattern um, uh, from a simple point of view rep represents the, the cell of origin. And that's one basis of how we classify tumors is based on the presumed cell of origin. And layered on top of that are the changes that occur epigenetically that are required during tumor genesis. Some changes that, are, that occur during the formation of, of a particular tumor type um, uh, can have a profound effect on the methylation pattern, and we can use that to our advantage. And so, uh, in addition, we can, we, even when histopathology is, is definitive, like for example, medulloblastoma, um, we can refine that um, by methylation pattern into one of the subclasses. Mm -hmm. 
uh, an advantage here methylation is it's a stable marker of, of cell of, of the cell it it's stable over time when we take match primary and recurrent um, tumors we find that the methylation pattern is quite stable over time and so that gives us uh, a, a good sense of stability um, for the, the use of methylation it works well in um, in the samples that we have to work with which is formula fixed paraffin bed and samples that, that's another practical advantage and it's a single test that can be uh, implemented that it can apply to be applied to a wide range of tumor types we have many immunohistochemical stains many of them are specific only for one or two uh, tumor types and they all have to be individually validated etc this is one test that in concept um, can be used for a wide range of, of, of tumor types so what we know about methylation is that um, as i mentioned it's it's stable and it's a mark of cell of origin and in tumors it's also it's also stable uh, as opposed to some other genomic aberrations, for example, gene expression. And so, as I mentioned, methylation pro pro profiles are, are that combination of cell of origin plus the changes acquired during tumor genesis. So here's some normal histology. And if you can imagine, these all came from the same patient. You can ask, well, they all have the same DNA sequence, pretty much, ACTG, et cetera, for 3 billion base pairs. How are these tissues so different? They're not different based on their primary DNA sequence, they're different. The, 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 the reason, the biologic basis for these differences is epigenetics. So these tissues, uh, here's liver, here's uh, colon, here's kidney, uh, skin, et cetera, differ not on their DNA sequence, but on the, on the modifications on the DNA, and that's DNA methylation. So if we could reverse engineer a situation where we knew the methylation pattern of liver, and we didn't know what the tissue was, we could profile it in concept and, and, and show that, in fact, that was that was liver. So that's the concept behind methylation profiling as, as a diagnostic. So I mentioned the WHO uh, 2022 uh, Blue Book. Um, <clears throat> it um, lists a large variety of entities that occur in and around the central nervous system. Um, on, on my count, it's 110 distinct diagnostic entities. Uh, that are in just the brain tumor, the CNS tumor uh, blue book. And 22, oops, sorry, 22 of these are new compared to uh, six years ago. So it's highly complex. There's a lot to keep track of, and it's evolving <clears throat> over time. And going, going into that blue book, um, what's new as compared to 2016 is that many of these entities uh, approximately half to my count and most of the new 22 new entities have methylation based classification as either an, an essential criteria or recommended criteria for diagnosis, showing the value and the, and the, the probability that this the use of methylation is going to increase um, you know, in, in our field. It has some advantages um, in, in the diagnostic process. With uh, typical methods like immunohistochemistry or FISH, we need to sort of think of the diagnosis and do a test that can either prove it or refute it. Um, so if, if, if we think it might be a K27M mutant glioma, diffuse mutant glioma, we, we then need to, to think of getting that immunostain for K27M or getting that sequencing for the K20H3K27 mutation. Methylation has an advantage that you can, you can run it, and even if you didn't think of this, you, you still can get that suggestion. So it has that, that uh, advantage that it doesn't require a prior consideration of, diagno of, of a diagnosis, and therefore can serve as a nice checklist function um, for, for diagnosis in, in case that diagnosis was missed or it wasn't thought of, uh, et, et cetera. And so uh, I think I've already mentioned this. Um, but the bottom line is that um, by screening uh, many methylation sites, um, there, there are uh, uh, millions of methylation sites across uh, the, the genome. And by, by interrogating a, a large subset of those sites, one can then re reverse engineer using machine lear learning to define methylation classes that track with specific entities. And it, initially, it was reassuring that many of these methylation patterns did in fact track to what we already knew about histologic uh, tumor types, glioblastoma, medulloblastoma, ependymoma. And so th that there was this correlation between, initially between the methylation profile 
and the histopathologic entity. So that gave encouragement to develop a brain tumor classifier. And that was published um, uh, now four years ago with a, a, a large group of individuals primarily spearheaded by the um, uh, DKFZ in Heidelberg, Germany. Uh, I was one of the middle authors here. As you can see, it was very much of a, a, a team effort but spearheaded by the, D, the DKFZ. <clears throat> and here's a, a figure from that paper showing the initial aspects of the initial classifier. Here there are 82 different um, tumor entities. Uh, each one given uh, given a name or abbreviation that uh, you can recognize. Here, GBM. These are some of the GBM uh, uh, subclasses: glioblastoma, and, and their subclasses. This is diffuse midline glioma K27 um, altered. Here's medulloblastoma um, sonic hedgehog uh, subtypes. Here's medulloblastoma group three and group four, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea here is this becomes the reference set that when you now have a new tumor. You profile on the methylation and you see where it goes. So the, the methylation depends on comparison of your tumor, of the tumor in question, to a reference set. And the methylation classification is only as good as the reference set. So if, if the tumor entity under, under question um, is something that is not in the reference set, methylation will not necessarily be helpful. Uh, it could lead to new discovery of new entities, et cetera, but um, it, it really depends on having a large and diverse uh, reference set. And, you know, I, I just showed this case early on um, from a number of years ago that uh, was important to me that it, it, although, you know, it, it sounds perhaps um, not so exciting to do methylation on tumors, but once you once you start seeing tumors and the and uh, how it can affect specific cases, um, you become a believer. At least that's that's my interpretation. Here's a case that we, we received on the outside that was given a diagnosis of glioblastoma, and it had some features of glioblastoma, including microvascular proliferation. The patient was getting uh, treatment for glioblastoma, radiation, chemotherapy, et cetera. We looked at it histologically. We didn't think it was, but th then it becomes this problem of inter-observer variability and who's right. You know, us versus them, no, no one really knows for sure because there's no objective basis for that. We ran methylation and we found it to be a, um, a pilocytic, um, pilocytic astrocytoma, uh, a grade one tumor, uh, which of course is not something that normally needs um, such intensive therapy. And we were able to uh, affect the management of, uh, of this patient. So the bottom line is that it serves as a nice quality check um, for difficult uh, diagnosis. So what we've done since um, at the NCI, uh, we started this process about three years ago of implementing this clinically for clinical diagnosis. And as uh, Dr. Miller mentioned, uh, we've been receiving cases from uh, outside institutions, they're difficult cases. And we've been uh, to, to date profile about, about 3000 uh, tumors. And we, we simply have a practice of any case received um, from the outside or, or internally uh, received from our operating room is submitted for, for, for DNA methylation, uh, in part to learn how we can use the classifier and also to, um, you know, occasionally, even when we think we know the diagnosis by histology, every once in a while we are, we are, uh, we can't be surprised. And so we're using this in the routine diagnostic workup. And we're using the, the, the classifier that I showed that was uh, developed from the um, group in, in, in Heidelberg. And we use alternative visualization techniques that I'll show you um, to complement um, the, the specific classifier. So it's, it, it's conceptually very straightforward. We, we use uh, tissue unstained slides or tissue block, and we isolate the DNA and we run it on a, a, an, an array, an alumina methylation array. We, we all always use the same array in most of the in fact, the, um, others use the exact same array, and that provides a nice sense of uniformity. And that's run on the uh, on, on, on the on a particular instrument, and then we get uh, 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 Im image files from that. And then that's by using machine learning, as I say, is uh, dissected down into a specific class. With the classifier, one gets a tumor class: uh, you know, metalloblastoma group three, uh, ependymoma. Relay fusion, et cetera, et cetera. So you get the class, the name of that, and then you also get a, a score, a confidence score. The score can range from zero to one. One wants the score to be as close to one as possible, 
because that, that means uh, very, very high confidence. And then clinically, we need to set a cutoff. And so we've used um, the cutoff of 0 0.84. Just that seemed a reasonable cutoff based on what others had been using. And so for, for definitive diagnosis, um, we use a, a class for a cutoff of 0 0.84 or above. Um, we oftentimes do not get uh, a class with that confidence score. Sometimes we get what we call a no match. It doesn't match to anything. Um, other times we get a match, but with a confidence score of zero, uh, below 0 0.84. Sometimes it's close, 0 0.8. Sometimes it's not so close, 0 0.3, et cetera. And so that's when judgment, that's when uh, looking at other aspects of the case uh, become uh, very important. And so you know, some, some general rules is that um, if it's 0.5, or between 0.5 and 0.83, then we consider that suggestive, but it's cautious. If it's below 0.3, then we essentially consider that a, a no match. And so we've looked at this now retrospectively um, on the cases that we profiled to date, and we can categorize, we, we, we tried to estimate the, the value of the class square. Huh? I mean, it looks great, et cetera, it's, 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 it's pretty fancy, but what, what does it actually contribute? I mean, if, if it's not contributing anything over and above what we can already do, then why do it? And so we tried to measure that impact by comparing cases that we received from the outside that had an outside diagnosis, pre-methylation diagnosis, and we ran methylation, and then we gave it now a integrated diagnosis that included DMA, DNA methylation and then categorized for how what change was made, if any. Sometimes the diagnosis was simply confirmed. It was the the methylation simply showed that yes, it was what we thought it was before we did the methylation. Other times um, it was consistent with the diagnosis, but it refined it. For example, the initial diagnosis might've been medulloblastoma, but methylation was able to show, okay, yes, it is med medulloblastoma, but it's a sonic hedgehog subtype or it's a wind subtype. Um, Sometimes, so, so in, in that sense, it had a contribution, although it didn't change the diagnosis per se. Sometimes it did change the diagnosis. Uh, perhaps that initial diagnosis was not known. Maybe it was descriptive. Maybe it could only be called an embryonal tumor or high-grade glioma. And at times, methylation was contributory to actually defining that diagnosis for that case. Um, sometimes it was misleading or non-contributory. Um, Maybe it was no match case, or maybe it gave us a low score for some entity that really wasn't probably consistent. Um, so these kinds of things all, all could happen. So we tried to measure that. And um, we, as I showed earlier, we, we used a reference set. We've expanded our reference set now to having um, over uh, 12,000, this is an old slide, but we have now over 15,000 uh, brain tumors that um, have, have been mapped on uh, by methylation onto a uh, onto a reference set, and you can see um, the variety of the brain tumors, uh, et cetera. And so, when, when we get a new tumor, we map it uh, to this, and we find that the higher the sample size, the, the, the better we we can do with respect to accurate uh, classification. And so, as I mentioned, um, it it's, um, requires a large data set. We use that zero point eight four um, threshold, and sometimes we don't get a match. And so we have to use orthogonal data, clinical information, how it looks on the microscope. Um, are there mutations that are tumor specific? Um, are there copy number changes that are tumor specific that, that can, that can um, uh, contribute to the diagnosis? And what we find is that it's best, and I think it was mentioned earlier, that we, uh, it's working together, combining cases from multiple centers, we've been starting to work with a number of centers, really uh, is going to be essential. To, to, to making this work because no one institution is gonna have sufficient number of cases, especially rare entities to be able to pull this off. And so um, how can we change or refine a diagnosis? Um, I'll give you a couple examples here. Here was one case, it was a high grade glioma in a young adult patient, uh, it was IDH wild type. Um, and it, it was near uh, glioblastoma, but it wasn't quite there in glioblastoma. And what we noticed is when we, when we looked to where this particular tumor uh, mapped, it mapped to tumors that had been previously known to have mismatch repair deficiency, um, which can occur in children and young adults. 
with, uh, with high-grade uh, gliomas. And we know that um, the conventional therapy is contraindicated um, in, that, um, in, in that setting. And we were able to uh, provide some information um, that this patient uh, might, might respond to an immune checkpoint inhibitor. So methylation can contribute to actually clinical management of that patient by giving an accurate diagnosis. And based on this finding on the methylation, we then uh, were triggered to look for mismatch repair deficiency, and we, we were able to confirm that. And so that's, I, I think, how methylation can contribute. It, provide, it sets up the hypothesis that then can be tested with, a, with a, an orthogonal test and potentially affect patient management. Here's another case um, that uh, it was a, a very young child with embryonal tumor. Um, it was intact for INI1, which is the marker we use most commonly for to diagnose ATRTs, which lose INI1. Uh, but in this case, INI1 was intact. So what do we do? Well, um, it mapped to, to ATRT by methylation, but rarely these tumors can have an alternative um, a mutation in um, SMARC A4. And so we were able to then prove that. But we wouldn't have thought of doing that if we didn't have that, that methylation class. So that's an example of how methylation can work together um, to really integrate a, a particular diagnosis. And so I mentioned that we measured um, the impact of methylation um, in, um, in, in the work that we've done. Um, when we got to about a thousand cases, we, we simply asked, what is the contribution of methylation by comparing the pre-classifier, the pre-methylation diagnosis to the final diagnosis? Um, and what, what was the impact? And so I, I won't go over it. I'll just go over the, chain, the, the impact here at, with you at, at a high level. But the bottom line is <clears throat> that of the <clears throat> 1,000 or so cases, about two thirds of them, 65%, got us the classifier score of 0.84 or above. So the good news is that in many times, methylation gave us a definitive answer. The other way to look at it is that um, in about a third of the cases, it didn't. Uh, so leaving room for, I think, um, ways we can improve the classifier. That said, what, what could we do with the data that, that, that we, we, we obtained? So here you can see sort of how things were affected. Um, about a third of the cases, we simply confirmed the diagnosis. Methylation uh, gave the answer that was already suspected um, before methylation. Sometimes we were able to refine the diagnosis. I gave the example of medulloblastoma. We were able to subtype or ependymoma. We was consistent. We found that it was an ependymoma, but we were able to show it's an ependymoma rela fusion positive or yap fusion positive, etc. Sometimes we were able to give a new diagnosis that wasn't suspected on, on, on initial review. Um, sometimes the things were suggestive but weren't definitive, and um, uh, sometimes 10% of the cases or so methylation simply was not contributory. We we, we really couldn't. Uh, improve the diagnosis based on the, the, the methylation class. And here's one way to look at the data. We're here on the left uh, is the pre-classifier diagnosis. Uh, in the middle is the methylation class. And then on the right is the final uh, integrated uh, uh, diagnosis. And so, uh, there's some interesting things I think one can glean from the data. Um, down here are the, are the ependymomas things that were called ependymoma um, before uh, methylation. And uh, many times they mapped to ependymoma and were able to be uh, subtyped to a particular class and mapped to uh, ependymoma on final diagnosis. But sometimes it was given a different diagnosis, medulloblastoma, glioblastoma, G34, um, uh, MN1 altered uh, glioma, et cetera. <clears throat> so, uh, the methylation had a contribution here, both refining the diagnosis of pinema, but also sometimes uh, changing it. Here are pilocytic astrocytomas showing something similar, where many times it was confirmed, other times it was changed into an alternative diagnosis. And so this is sort of the, 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 uh, the impact. And you can see here on the upper right, um, uh, when we track the initial diagnosis labeled here, um, pre-methylation, for example, astrocytoma, IDH mutated, most of the times it was in green confirmed. So when it comes in as an IDH mutated astrocytoma, we most of the time we, we, we confirm it. There's other tumor entities where it's less commonly uh, confirmed. 
pilocytic astrocytoma or anaplastic pilocytic astrocytoma. Um, it was confirmed half the time, but other times uh, we, we couldn't confirm it. Um, Medulloblastoma, as I mentioned, methylation plays a big role in refining the diagnosis. And sometimes when the tumor came in as un an unclassified entity, and that's shown here, um, uh, it was given a descriptive diagnosis where methylation was able to uh, many times resolve it. Not all the time. Sometimes we could only give it a uh, descriptive diagnosis, but many times methylation could, could, could resolve it. And so that's, that's sort of the impact of, of, of methylation uh, in, in this particular uh, case series. And you know, I, I highlight GBM here because GBM is a, is a diagnosis that's common um, that uh, most neuropathologists and pathologists can, can recognize. But even in glioblastoma, the most common intrinsic tumor we see, um, although most of the time methylation confirmed it, there were times where the methylation profile mapped to something else. Um, for example, pilocytic astrocytoma, as I've shown you, uh, pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma, et cetera. Sometimes an IDH mutation was missed and it was mapped to an IDH mutant glioma. So even one of the more common scenarios we see of glioblastoma, occasionally methylation can have an impact on, on the diagnosis. And I've already shown you um, cases that came in as unclassified that in many instances, um, we could come up with, by methylation with a, with a specific um, ancillary diagnosis. And one thing we, we, we did when possible is when a case came to a specific class that had, that had a, a, a mutational profile that was specific um, or a copy number profile, et cetera, in many cases, we were able to then prove that. So for example, if it came in as a diffuse midline glioma K27M mutant, we were then able to show that K27M mutation or the G34 uh, mutation or the FOXR2 uh, alteration for, for this particular tumor type. So um, it, it, it wasn't that, that we uh, used methylation only as the, the final arbiter, but when we could, we tried to supplement that with complementary data uh, to come to a final diagnosis. And our experience is similar to what's out there in the literature. Here's a case, uh, sorry, a, 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 a paper from uh, France looking at 62 uh, pediatric tumors profiled over a couple of years uh, in their network. And they showed qualitatively the same thing that using the same 0.84 cutoff, that in their series, only 40% of the cases uh, had, had that cutoff. So again, methylation is not perfect. Um, it still requ uh, <laughs> requires some judgment and it does not always give us the answer per se. <clears throat> um, that said, here's some of the impact as, as they saw it. Um, that, uh, again, non-informative or inconsistent. Sometimes it gave a new diagnosis, novel proposition. Sometimes it was refined and sometimes it was confirmed. And here's, I won't go into detail, but here, here's some of the breakdown on, on the individual uh, tumor types. So, so methylation, uh, I think, across um, other centers uh, has an impact as well. Although it's not the answer always in, in and of itself, and things need, need to be interpreted uh, in, 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 in the con into context. It has technical, um, uh, I think, challenges. One of them is tumor purity. Uh, sometimes the, the tumors the pathologists receive are highly pure. Sometimes because of the specific tumor type or the tissue that's available, the tumor purity is low. Maybe it's on, on, on the edge of a lesion or maybe that particular tumor type is just endowed with a, with a, a large uh, amount of non-neoplastic tissue. And so methylation has, has, has a challenge there and sometimes does not give us the information we need when tumor purity is low and when the, when the non-neoplastic uh, elements um, are, are, are predominant. And we've found ways to address that here in our case series. We did find a number of, 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 of tissues of tumors that we thought were probably neoplastic, but they had a lot of non-neoplastic elements and inflammatory elements, and they in fact matched to the inflammatory brain tissue. Um, but we were able to informatically deconvolve this data and try to re, uh, in silico remove some of that non-neoplastic element. We were able to resolve many of these tumors into a specific uh, tumor type. 
And so we're just at, at the beginning of trying to resolve that. So one example of how we can improve how we um, look at, uh, at the methylation classifier. So this I've mentioned already that on, on a thousand tumors or, or so, um, the, these, this is the breakdown um, showing that methylation has an impact in uh, many of these cases, but not all of these cases. And um, so there is work to do. There is um, experience, I think is important, especially when the class score is low and the ability to integrate that with other information um, and discussion with our clinical colleagues is really quite, quite, quite important. And so there are some surprises, some surprises we've learned from methylation. One of them I'll just su suggest here is that uh, there, are, there are occasional cases that by histology look like one thing, but by methylation, they look like something else. And it's not to say they are that something else, but it becomes an interesting, uh, I think, uh, pattern for discovery on how we resolve when the histology doesn't match with what we expect it would, should match to by methylation. Here's a case here that, that uh, pretty much any neuropathologist I know would call this glioblastoma, highly cellular, pseudopalocytic necrosis, et cetera. Um, it was found to have a, a mutation that's not typical of glioblastoma, a BRF D600D mutation. And by methylation, it mapped two cases that were known to be pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma. On the copy number profile, it had a PXA-like signature, which is loss of CDKN2A, and it did not have a GBM signature, which would be gain of seven and loss, uh, gain of chromosome seven and loss of chromosome 10. Uh, same here as well. We're finding that uh, there are a number of tumors that mapped to the PXA methylation class that would not have been called PXA based on their initial histologic uh, designation. And so that's where some discovery goes and raises the question, how will this patient behave? It looks like a GBM histologically, it maps to something else. And so further work I think needs to, to demonstrate how such cases, um, how, how these patients do. And I think it, it changes the way we think about um, um, how we define a particular uh, tumor class. And it can be a humbling experience as well. Here's a case um, I had uh, a couple of years ago in the lower lumbar uh, spinal cord. Um, the outside diagnosis was myxopapillary pneumoma. I saw the myxoid areas. I perhaps was lulled into a sense of complacency and gave it the same diagnosis. Um, but we then ran methylation and it turns out I was completely wrong. It was something else. It was a paraganglioma. Um, uh, now it didn't look necessarily like a paraganglioma. I wouldn't have thought of it at our consensus conference. We, we didn't think of it, but the, the data are the data. And so based on that, we then went back to this case and we did follow up IHC and showed that it was not positive for GFPP, which it should have been if it was a mix of papillary pneumoma, and it was positive for uh, chromogranin, a marker of, uh, of, of paraganglioma. So it, it can be a humbling experience where much, <clears throat> much of what we thought we knew by, by histology sometimes is not always, always correct. So our current practice is um, when in doubt, we give a preliminary diagnosis. Um, but then follow it up uh, and wait for a definitive diagnosis until we can do the, the methylation. And here, here's an, a, 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 some uh, experience from uh, another group from uh, Denmark that published their, their, their experience um, on, on a number of cases. And I won't go over the detail, but the, the bottom line is, is most centers see about the same thing where here they used the 0.9 cutoff, we used 0.84, but it's, it's a similar kind of situation where, um, in their series, again, about a third of the cases did, did, didn't match. Um, and here they show the impact of, of the methylation class classifier and that uh, a number of these tumors don't match. So, so there, there, is, there is work to do. So what about these cases um, that, that don't match? Um, there's a number of reasons for that. I mentioned um, technical issues, uh, DNA quality. Uh, the case uh, could, could be an old case. Uh, that, so that can affect the, the, the methylation process. Tumor purity can be an issue. The other reason is that the, the tumor in question is not represented in the classifier. So the, the, the classifier is a reference set and you compare that tumor to the reference set. If the reference set doesn't have that entity, then methylation is not going to give you the answer. And so it could be a new entity. And that, that's the discovery concept here. That's how the classifier uh, can, can grow over time 
with accumulation of more data into a central repository. And here's one example here of, of how that could be leveraged. We noticed um, in our uh, in the process of, of doing these cases that we found a, a number of tumors that were close to pleomorphic xanthoracer xanthoma, but weren't, were not in the cluster. The, the classifier gave a low score for PXA or, 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 or something else. And by uh, on this UMAP, they were near PXA, but they weren't in it. And so they really weren't in the classifier. And then we started looking at other characteristics of, of, of these tumors. Uh, methylation does provide copy number uh, uh, aber aberrations as, as a side benefit. So we could see that, that virtually all of these tumors had loss of chromosome 13 and, and also sometimes chromosome 17. Um, we found that many of them had NF1 mutations. Many, many of them had um, other, other kinds of mutations. And furthermore, they didn't have PXA features. They didn't have that CDK and 2A uh, homozygous loss that we like to see for PXA. So what are these? They weren't in the classifier. They seem to be clustering together. They seem to have other uniform characteristics. Could, could they be something else? And how, and, and, and how could we unify this? Here's some of the, the, the histology of these cases that map to that cluster. You can see a great variety of histopathologic appearance. Sometimes the cell, cells had perinuclear halos, sort of like an oligodendroglioma. Sometimes they had palisading of nuclei, like an ependomoma. Sometimes, here's more ependomoma-like structures. Sometimes they look papillary. Sometimes they looked extremely pleomorphic, like a PXA. Um, for example, sometimes they looked something different. And so, uh, the, one can imagine why these tumors had not been classified before, because they didn't have histology to unify them. But now with methylation, we can try on a biological basis to, to, to unify them. And, and we gave it an, an initial uh, name uh, of, of, of this, like, which could be changed in the future, but this was our best name, high-grade glioma with pleomorphic and, su and pseudopapillary features. We were able to show that it's distinct from other entities and clusters separately uh, from them, et cetera. And again, when we compare it to PXA, it has that chromosome 13 loss. It does not have uh, CDK and 2A loss and compared to another entity, same, same thing. So it has other features that distinguish it. And there's some clinical implications here as well. If we look at the age of, of patients with this this provisional entity of HPAP compared to uh, glioblastomas, uh, PXAs, uh, pilocytics, et cetera. It had a, a distinct age group. Uh, young adults um, around 50 um, was the median age or so. And then, of course, we need to know why does this matter? Um, is there a clinical uh, implications here? Some of these cases did come in as a with a glioblastoma histopathology diagnosis. But here we can see that these HPAPs patients, again, small sample size, only 30 or so patients, but seem to have better outcome than patients with glioblastoma, um, and also better outcome than patients with pleomorphic xanthoestrocytoma. So there, there could potentially be some clinical implications um, to, to getting this right as, as a diagnosis. Um, and so just one other example um, that we're working on now, and that is an, a subtype potentially of posterior fossa pendomoma. And so uh, many of you know that a pendomoma, although in, in the past was given sort of a single diagnosis of a pendomoma or anaplastic pendomoma, now is subdivided according to its location in the, in the three major compartments, supernatorial, posterior fossa, and spinal cord. And uh, it's been known for, some, for a number of years now that some molecular alterations can, can define these. For example, relay fusions are, are pretty much specific to supernatorial tumors. They don't generally occur in, in tumors of other compartments. Posterior, posterior fossa tumors can be divided into subependomoma, uh, ependomoma uh, group A and, and group B, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so each, it was found reassuringly that these classes also have their corresponding methylation defined group. They can be separated from each other based on, based on methylation. And so that's sort of the current um, uh, thinking on ependomoma, and that's pretty much represented in the, in the WHO with some, some recent additions. But what we found was a, a rare case that uh, looked, it was in the posterior fossa, and it looked 
by methylation like a PFB, posterior faucet type B, but it wasn't quite there. The score was low, didn't cluster quite with it, um, and it was sort of outside that, that group. And by chance, um, that tumor had been sequenced and a mutation uh, in ACVR1 that had not yet been described with panomomas um, was noted. And so we sort of filed that away. Isn't that interesting? And then over time, we, additional cases collected that by methylation mapped to this same case, the same index case. And we sequenced those and we also found ACVR1 mutations in those. Again, not getting to this concept of a, 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 of a new en entity. And we can show um, some of the results here. Here we've got PFB, which now can be subdivided into subclasses, but these are all PFBs. We have uh, uh, posterior fossa type A epinomomas. Here are some, some other epinomoma related entities as well. Here are the uh, ACVR1. Uh, we found them to be trimethyl positive as compared to PFAs, which are trimethyl negative, but they were a distinct uh, entity. And what's the clinical implication? You know, you can say, well, so what? Uh, but you uh, potentially there, there could be um, some clinical relevance to that. And that's because uh, diffuse midlangliomas are known to have ACVR1 activating mutations. And there is interest in development of clinical trials that target this ACVR1 activating mutation in diffuse midline uh, glioma. And so um, here's some of the other features of this tumor type here. Here you can see the, the group that all have ACVR1 um, uh, mutations, and they're distinct from diffuse mid midline gliomas that are ACVR1 mutant based on their mutational profile. The specific mutations that occur in the epinomomas seem to be similar to the ones that occur in the diffuse midline glioma. These are hotspot mutations that overlap between the two tumor types. So these are activating oncogenic uh, mutations. And it's interesting to us that uh, looking at these ACVR1 tumors is at least preclinical data to suggest that a clinical trial could be considered for AC to target ACVR1 in diffuse midline gliomas. And so that raises the possibility that these tumors in the future could also be also be targeted. And so um, you know, what, what kind of lessons are we learning from using methylation in brain tumor diagnostics? And that is the classifier in methylation can raise a hypothesis that wasn't previously entertained, that wasn't thought of. Um, but then that, that could be a hypothesis that could then be then tested and confirmed or refuted. I mentioned examples of, of uh, H3 uh, mutated gliomas, either K27M or G34R mutated gliomas can then, if suggested by methylation, can then be confirmed by either immunohistochemistry or sequencing. The, uh, another, uh, I think, application is that there's some entities that really, I think, are emerging that can only be confidently diagnosed by, by the methylation classifier. That includes many pediatric embryonal tumors. We, we can get to an embryonal neoplasm by conventional means, but we can't get more specific, and methylation can help classify that. There's other entities, I uh, list this one here, that realistically can only be, the histology is not specific and can uh, really be only uh, diagnosed by, by, by methylation. That said, although helpful in these situations, I think as I've shown you, there are cases remain. The, the classifier is not perfect. And there are a number of cases that simply cannot be classified by methylation for a variety of reasons, technical, uh, maybe there are rare cases um, or, or, or what have you. So there's more to learn. Uh, new entities likely exist. And the classifier is only as good as a reference set on which that tumor is, is compared with. And so the larger and more representative the reference set, the better the classifier and the better we're able to accurately diagnose cases. And again, ra raising the advantage of combining data um, rather than uh, rather than siloing siloing that data. So just in my last few slides, I think I've probably shown this already. But basically, the methylation process starts with FFPE uh, tissues. Uh, fresh frozen can be used as well, but typically we use FFPE tissues and undergoes um, uh, the hybridization process, etc. We then use a classifier and machine learning and. and uh, clustering uh, techniques to help us get to an entity. We then compare that to orthogonal data, copy number data, 
Um, we can detect 1P19Q co-deletion for oligodendroglioma, uh, EGFR amplification, et cetera, um, that helps us uh, confirm or refute the particular diagnosis. We can uh, identify MGMT promoter methylation, uh, et cetera. So it's really the integration of these um, all things together that gets us to an integrated um, integrated uh, diagnosis. And I gave showed this slide at the beginning um, that really it's an integrated approach using all the relevant data um, that, that that's available uh, and ensuring that everything can fit. And here, you know, methylation doesn't replace any of these modalities, but it can add to it, um, particularly with difficult to diagnose. Uh, cases. So I'll summarize by hoping that I convinced you that uh, methylation profiling has some practical advantages as, as an additional tool, not to replace what we have, but to add to it. Um, and with experience, it, I think it can improve the accuracy of diagnosis for particular cases. It has advantages of being technically feasible, amenable to FFP samples, and it's uh, relatively stable um, over time and across tumor region. It by no means solves all of our problems and it needs to be interpreted in context. One cannot ignore the other information because um, methylation is just one part of the armamentarium of tumor diagnostics. And, and that additional information, uh, information is absolutely critical um, to integrate with the methylation. Uh, and sometimes we need that. Um, sometimes we need the genomic information that can help us get to a specific diagnosis or a specific targeted therapy for that patient that methylation can't can provide. So more, more can be done to learn how to utilize this and integrate this into uh, classification into daily, into daily practice. So with that, I will conclude and thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to discuss or answer, answer any questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aldepi. This is a fantastic uh, lecture. Uh, it's certainly given me a lot of insight into methylization, methylation and it's, um, you know, the, the science behind it as well as its, uh, its, uh, what, its application and its limitation. And uh, so this is very useful and all these lectures are recorded and I'll speak to the speakers uh, whether they can be on public domain and but so so you know all of you can review it uh, so thank you very much dr aldapi uh, dr miller do you have any questions i don't have any questions i guess i also want to thank dr aldapi very much for his talk and also for his ability to uh, to do this on short notice uh, since we've all put this course together uh, with very little uh, lead time so very much appreciate it ken thanks for the opportunity Thank you. Th thank you. Can I just ask uh, Dr. Cohen if you are there? Do you have any questions, comments? Uh, Dr. Aldap, I have got some a few practical questions to ask. Uh, uh, this is because as a neurosurgeon, I don't. Uh, 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 Dr. Cohen is here. Dr. Cohen, do you want to? Do you have any comments, questions? Um, can you hear me? Yes, I we can. Yes, Dr. I'm Cohen. I'm sorry. I'm I'm calling in from the OR from Johns uh, Hopkins, but uh, I just wanted to say that was a beautiful talk. And again, I think the future is going to be in this hybrid uh, diagnosis that's coming out from CNS5 and the ability to use this information to help therapy. But no, it was a beautiful talk. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Aldopi, in terms of uh, the amount of time for, for you to give the diagnosis and in terms of the expense. And Dr. Miller previously mentioned the reference set, if I, did, if I got it correct, that the reference set is mainly based in Germany. And uh, uh, can you comment on those three questions in yeah. terms of expense, time, and the reference set? Thanks. Yeah, um, so uh, time, it, 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 practically speaking, it's about, it's about two weeks. It takes us uh, you know, a few days to isolate the DNA and. We have to do by cell by conversion, and then we run it, et cetera, sort of, sort of from soup to nuts. We're, we're at about uh, at, at about two weeks uh, turn turnaround time. The costs on on, on the, the reagents, you know, the stuff, the juice that you need to do it, it's about three hundred dollars per case. Then there's the the uh, 
the labor, it's, et cetera. Uh, but about three hundred dollars in in uh, disposable co in disposables for, for, for costs. And, and the reference set, um, you're right. The initial reference set was uh, uh, based in Germany. Uh, we are developing um, our own. We would like to make it um, publicly available. If, if I can, if I can share my screen real quick. What we what we'd like to do is um, we're developing this portal that would be uh, uh, available to uh, to the public, to registered users. Uh, to date, we've got um, about almost 14,000 uh, uh, CNS tumors. And this is something where someone could run methylation either through us or through their own uh, uh, lab, and they could upload their, their uh, uh, data onto this portal and then they they, they they can interact with this data they can look to see if you know if, if their tumor matches to a pinnamum pfa they can see where it goes um, they can uh, potentially um, look at characteristics of, of what's known about about these uh, about these patients we can show the uh, here's the kaplan meyer survival uh, of this we can compare that so we can't see you. We can't see your screen, Doctor Aldabi. Oh, I'm so sorry. Sorry. Thank. I so I'm so sorry. No, that's right. Okay. So uh, I, I apologize. So here is the um, the uh, the portal that I'm that, that I'm talking about uh, that shows about fourteen thousand uh, brain tumors that that we've uh, collected to to date. Um, one can up upload their sample in. Um, in this, and then see where it maps. For example, if it goes to uh, a penomoma posterior fossa type A, uh, one can then uh, interact with the data. And if there is survival data on these patients, uh, we can look at that, can, can, can compare it uh, to uh, cert patient survival from, for example, this is posterior fossa penomoma type, type B, uh, et cetera. And, um, do, do, do these kinds of things. So this is this is sort of one of the efforts we're trying to do to democratize this mm -hmm. and to take advantage of the fact that the classifier depends on a large and diverse reference set. And then the tumor that's uploaded um, by individuals can then be then used to add and further develop the, uh, the, 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 cl the classifier. So these are some of the some of the ways that we're trying to um, move this forward. Also, I think it's going to promote a standardization across centers. One wants to have similar uh, diagnostics and criteria so that uh, a methylation class at one institution gives us the same answer as a methylation class uh, across another. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Aldapi. I'm just going to give uh, the chair back to Dr. Miller. Thank you, Dr. Miller. 